not everything that I say tonight is going to apply necessarily to you as an individual. So I'm going to, um, I put, jet, tend to put a lot of information into a presentation so that at least there's at least one or two or three things that you can grab, pull out of it for yourself or for your operation. So I'm going to be pretty fast paced and at the end, um, we'll try to do some questions and answers. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my family. Uh, I am, I was raised in Pennsylvania. I always describe myself as a country boy from Pennsylvania, but I am also first generation Mexican American. My uh, father is Mexican. He immigrated to the United States in the 70s and he had five children with my mother. And to be honest with you, we didn't really even know we were Mexican until we were teenagers and we realized that we were Mexican. So, um, so if you've never met a six foot one Mexican, you have now. <laughs> And, uh, and I love basketball, so I've been effective on the court. I, I tricked people because they didn't give me any credit, you know, b being a Mexican on a basketball court. But six foot one helps out. So I've got three sons. Uh, the youngest is here. You probably saw him running around. That's Joaquin. Two older boys. The oldest is Josiah, which is in the middle. He is now 19. Uh, he's been with me operating in my company and by my side since he was a little boy. Uh, back in the day, in a different company we owned, we had a branch in Pittsburgh, and um, I have an old cell phone video of him pulling annuals out like five years old with me. So uh, he's been, he's been in, the, in the game with me a long time. His younger brother, and who used to be the youngest, is James. James will be 18 in October, so he's 17 now. And uh, James was, he was the baby of the family until COVID happened, and you know what happened in COVID, right? We all got trapped inside, and boom, there comes Joaquin. So. <laughs> Uh, my wife, Veronica, she is here, and I don't want you to turn around and look at her because you will embarrass her. She is quiet and, and, and modest and humble, so don't embarrass Veronica, but she is my bride for 23 years. So I am 43, 44, thank you. <laughs> I'm 44, I won't tell you her age, and uh, this, this year we celebrate 23 years. So uh, we... Um, we are both, both Mexican-American. My wife's from Texas. She's a Tejana. So uh, we have a lot of similarities in our culture and our upbringing and you know, food and, and uh, just things that we like. So we're pretty, pretty compatible people. Um, a little bit more loud and you know, in, in, engaging, we'll say. My wife is very reserved, OK? Uh, but you know, opposites attract, so it's worked, worked well. Um, just a little bit about the company. This is actually my second company. I built my first company and I sold it in 2014. Uh, technically December 31st to 14. I had a two-year non-compete. So I was starting East Coast facilities in 2015, but I, I really didn't have much room to, to build and to work for the first year. So I spent that time building what I call the infrastructure and the platform of the business. And since I sold my first company and East Coast Facilities was my second go, um, I did what probably any of you would do. I didn't do all the things that I shouldn't have done the first round, and I did do all the things that I wish I would have done the first round. So East Coast Facilities is absolutely one of the fastest growing companies in our space in the country. But a lot of that, um, there's a lot of pieces to that statement, but definitely being able to have a second go at it and avoid all the mistakes that I made uh, in, the, in the prior two decades or two and a half decades. And then really focusing on the things that I knew worked well helped me ramp the company up very quickly, okay? So what do we do? Uh, we are a commercial facility maintenance company. Our core service is industrial snow removal. So we're not shy about saying that. Our core service is industrial snow removal and everything that we do wraps and revolves around that. And the reason for that is for the experience that I have in the snow industry and my experience with the cash flows and margins involved with snow, it's a higher risk business, but it's a higher reward business. So I, just, I decided to go risk because I had resources and, and uh, I had resources to work with from selling off my first company. So I had, I had some house money to play with. I went with a more risky approach, but it's produced greater returns to let me ramp up and scale the business quickly. So that being said, we have a presence in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, 
in Florida, we do projects in other states on the East Coast, but there's no brick and mortar branches yet. Um, we are in the process of opening uh, our West Palm Beach branch right now, right in the middle of it. I, my wife and I just came from South Florida here. And our next market, which will open later in the fall, is Richmond, Virginia. And our next, those are, uh, Palm Beach is called a tropical market for us. Virginia is a transitional market, some snow, not a lot. It's a transitional market. Our next snow market is Chicago. We're going to Chicago within a year. We'll have a, and these are all organic startups, no acquisitions. Okay? So I just want to, I, I, I shared this in a SEMA conference because it's a, just give you an illustration of our, our ramp up and our growth. Um, what we're known for is self performing our services. So we self perform all of our services across the board. We do work with a few subcontractors here and there, um, depending on, on a project or a need. In snow removal, we have, I have a, a handful of contractors that work with us that have worked with me for 15, 20 years. And when I started ECF, I brought a couple of them over. They probably account for 2% of our production. Uh, but we do have some subcontractors. And we call them what they are, subcontractors. We don't call them service providers. They are subcontractors, right? Um, but just looking at the growth trajectory of our business, this is all self-performed services. 2015, we came online. 2015 to 2017 is our non-compete period. So we were doing a lot of facility maintenance work that didn't, didn't compete in the landscape and snow verticals where I had to stay out of for a period of time, okay? But you see quickly, 2017 to 2020, we went from, a, this is our plow truck and loader fleet, just to give you an idea. We went from 11 units to 165 units in three years. And all that customer portfolio was built ground up with just boots on the ground sales, business development. From 2020 to 2021, when we made the slide, this was presented last year, we were at 216 units. Um, we currently have between 50 and 70 units on order going into this upcoming winter. So we're growing, we're moving. We have more opportunities than we can allocate resources to. And that's, that's probably the same proportionately um, with a lot of companies, right? Because there is challenge with workforce. Uh, now we have manufacturing challenges, but um, we have a lot of opportunities. And what I'm gonna share with you tonight are some of the things, can't do it all in, uh, in two hours, an hour, hour and a half. Um, I'm gonna share with you some big rock things operationally or recruiting wise that has helped me and helped the company grow and scale with control, with very high retention rates. Uh, speaking of retention, just to give you an idea, year over year field retention across the board uh, over the past cycle is above 90% frontline labor retention, all right? That's just obviously a very high number. Management, it's like 99% management and sales. If you, if you retain your, your, your talent and develop your talent, you know what can come next. I'll dig into that in a little bit. Successful operations, the secret sauce. So. These are big rock issues that I, that I think are important. There certainly could be a couple of other things to add here, but just the way I'm breaking it down, discipline, consistency standards, mission, workforce development, customer service, forward-thinking business practices, okay? Now, when I get into forward-thinking business practices, I do pick a little, I pick a little bit on uh, Brightview and private equity companies. Don't take that personal. Uh, I, I would like to say that um, there's a place for Broker companies that just manage services and use all subcontractors. There's a place for Brightview. There's a place for private equity uh, roll-ups. I mean, that's it's the marketplace is massive, and there's a lot of different um, customer types and needs out there. Okay, we service the type of customers that want operators that are sustainable that perform the services. We do a lot of high-end or zero-tolerance work. Uh, it requires bulletproof operations and they wanna know who they're working with, they wanna see the iron on the ground, they wanna see the, the, the boots on the ground. Um, oh, and by the way, what does it cost, right? That's the type of customer we're working for, all right? So when I do pick on, and I will pick on a little bit, Brightview and private equity, I have no issue with any employee that works for these companies. It's the business models I don't particularly like. I share my opinions. We all have our opinions, okay? So if you have a smaller business or a regional business or a locally owned company, and I think a lot of you do, you shouldn't be intimidated by any big company, East Coast facilities, Brightview, private equity, you should never be intimidated because you can have an advantage that none of them have, including me, depending on the size of your business and, and how you position yourself in the market. 
All right, so I just want to explain my style. I'm not here to offend anybody or abuse the uh, privilege that I have to be up here speaking. But if you follow me on LinkedIn, and some of you do, I'm pretty much raw with what I say. I mean, I'm, you know, I try to behave myself, but I just say it like I think it is, okay? Discipline. Discipline causes us to do what is right over and over. It helps us to prioritize, execute best practices, and avoid habits that degrade our business. It starts with owners and managers. So outside of this picture, there's a picture of a manager engaging a team member because that manager got his ass out of bed, got to the facility on time so that he was there to greet his personnel, engage them, lead them, answer any questions they have, right? But it, it took him discipline, it takes him discipline. Now this particular manager, he has a name, his name is Tony. He shows up at the service center at 545 every morning in the Broward branch we have in South Florida. This guy's a beast. He never misses a day. He's very, very disciplined, okay? What I think is if we pay attention to ourselves in life, discipline can lead to good things. A person who is disciplined with fitness will be in better shape than a person who is not. A person who is disciplined with what he eats and drinks will have a healthier body than a person that is not. So discipline with our children, we see family units and children, or just children. Uh, one child is well disciplined in a loving way and he grows up a certain way and another child's running the streets not disciplined. Discipline's good for us. You know, balance, right? Proportionately to, to what the need is. I think there's a bit of a vacuum of discipline with owners where we're the owner and we can kind of do what we want. That's true, but not without a consequence. So I think there's room if we want to improve our operations, we need to be present and it requires discipline. And discipline is, as it says, discipline is, it's going to cause us to do what's right over and over because it's going to be our default. So that's, that's important to me. I, I think it would be beneficial if we think about how disciplined am I as a person, as a leader in business. Consistency. When I think of consistency, I think about like engraving, right? So I don't know if you ever got a gift, a crystal or a, a, some type of a ornamental thing where it's, where it's engraved, it's permanent, right? And consistent, consistency creates a permanence in a business operation. So I have a comment here. It says, consistency causes a safety meeting to occur every morning at 6.30 a.m. sharp without fail. Now that's a picture of stretch and flex. But um, I, I think that if you're going to, let's say you're gonna have a safety meeting. And as a business operation, you say, well, we're going to, uh, we think we can improve on our safety. And so we're gonna have a safety meeting every Monday or every Thursday or every Friday. And what happens with those like really, those goals that you have where you, you mean well and you establish the goal and you say, well, this is what we're gonna do and you start it. Week one, week two, uh, somebody was sick, week three. Okay, week four, somebody was sick, week five, week six, week seven, uh, and then it just like falls off the, right? It falls off, that's what happens. When you establish what I'm gonna get into is standards when you establish policies or when you establish um, any type of guideline in your business, you need to have consistency because that consistency will then allow you to engrave into your operation. Um, we use consistency to, to build and create those, those habits, right? So for instance, most of you, we all, we all commute to work. Uh, most of us drive a vehicle to work, right? Um, think about this, to work, to your local grocery store, to your wherever you fill up for gas near your home, you never think about which way you're gonna turn. You're just, you can like be on your phone, which you shouldn't be. You can be adjusting the radio. You can be on speakerphone speaking to somebody. You're not actually thinking, okay, oh, I gotta make a left up here. I gotta make a right up here. You just do it. Is that, do we agree with that? It's just automatic. Because you consistently take the same route back and forth to your home, to the gas station, to the grocery store. So it's like engraved in you, right? And that's what we're talking about is, is creating consistency in our operations so that things just happen automatic. The left turn happens automatic, the right turn happens automatic. But in order to do that, guess what, it, guess what you need? Slide number one, discipline. Otherwise it's not gonna happen. So consistency to me is a big rock issue. Now, this is uh, just a video of 
excuse me, a safety meeting. And um, it's created for content, but we talk about things like safety meeting and having a policy for safety meetings. Sometimes when we're trying to create a system or a process, we overcomplicate it. We don't need to do that. If you're gonna create a, a safety culture and you're gonna have safety meetings every Monday, that safety meeting could be 10 minutes long, and it should be. Because if you stand there and have a long meeting, all your team, and they don't remember all that stuff, hit all the big rock issues, follow up on it at a later time, but let, let them go to work. But it's the consistency there that matters. Don't overcomplicate it. What I would recommend, for instance, on this topic is get together as a team, pick out 20, 10 or 20 safety topics. What are areas we need to improve on or what are areas can we, can we discuss to prevent what we think might be uh, an issue in our operation, write down the topics, plot them out on a calendar, and then write down three, five, seven bullet points on that topic and cover them in a safety meeting. It's, n it's not that complicated. So just a quick video to show you kind of like what one of our just safety meetings will look like. It's very simple and then we'll keep moving. So this morning we're going to be talking about spotters. Anytime we're backing up a vehicle we should be using a spotter. Now what happens when we're by ourselves? Get out of the vehicle before we start backing up just to make sure there's nothing in the way. So before you put that in reverse, the person should already be out. We have to be in communication with the, with the driver. Do you think it's easy for him to see your hand gestures? So what we want you to do is to use big gestures. Just want to add one thing. As a driver, we need to make sure we have our windows down too. So you can hear you guys are about to back into something or you, know, you need to stop quickly. Window needs to be down and the radio has to go off. So you can hear adequately. Okay, so something like that, right? Get these, we've got big, sophisticated companies. It doesn't take a lot of sophistication to do, to, to, to employ and to, to deploy standards and systems and procedures that really are simple. And we can have like a paralysis by analysis where we're, we're trying to think about how this company does all this stuff instead of stepping back and saying, well, what do we need to do inside of our business and how can we do it in a simple, effective way? Keep it simple, right? So with something like this, with a program like this, if you kept it simple, if you didn't overcomplicate it and make it um, a burden, to your managers, your supervisors, or yourself as an owner. It doesn't matter if you have five employees or 500 employees. If you make it burdensome to you or your team, you're, it's gonna be more difficult to be consistent with it, right? So, so think about that as we're developing systems, as we're developing standards. We wanna be consistent, so make it effective, but make it, make it simple so that we can, um, we can make sure that it, it can continue, right? It's got life cycle to it. Okay, so, the next uh, topic that we're going to talk about a little bit is standards. Standards. Define standards. Tell us how we do things as an organization. Standards impact everything, including the type of customer we will work for, uniforms, safety rules, fleet composite, or how we install mulch, for example. Uh, standards should be clear and effective. So an example is, it is our standard at East Coast facilities to conduct monthly quality control reports on job sites on landscape management job sites. That's our standard. So every month, uh, the assigned account executive and a field supervisor will go out and they'll QC a property. Whatever issues that are our responsibility need to, need to get worked in with the team uh, or addressed with the team, they'll get with the team, they'll get those issues resolved proactively, and then um, they can also get with the client and get the client involved in any areas that they may be responsible. Some things are redundant, so they're marked in a report. So that means that if you do a quality control report and there's a dead royal palm at the entrance and then a month later there's still a dead royal palm, right? Sometimes the decision making to get these things addressed take time. So doing these QC reports, uh, we, can, we, we make simple notes just to say previously reported or previously reported, something like that. This is an example of one standard. But a business has to create standards. You have to create a whole variety of standards. You have to have standards in um, recruiting. You have to have standards in uh, how you're going to outfit your fleet. You have to have standards in uniforms. You have to have standards in your 
uh, accounting and finance department, your sales department, what are your, what are your pricing models and what standards are they, what type of customer are you going to work for? So New Jersey, um, Jones Lang LaSalle calls and says, hey, we've got a portfolio of uh, retail and we need to get numbers for snow. That doesn't meet our standard. We don't do, we, and we don't do retail in snow at East Coast. That doesn't meet our, our standard as a customer, okay? It's very, very price driven and it's very high uh, risk work. So we find, we find. But that's us, we established our standard. We're not setting a standard for you and we're not gonna apply your standard to us. So when you build standards, you gotta build them for your business model and for your company. You can get ideas from the marketplace, from a competitor, even another industry, but you should build standards. Uh, a big rock issue here, building standards and then over time recording them in a way that, uh, whether it's an operations manual or policy letters, recording them in a way where it's measurable, where you know what your standards are so that they can be taught as new people enter your business and your company. And as you have various um, assignments delegated or, or you're training new people. So establishing standards, very important. Once established, they should be clear, they should be in writing, and they should be accessible for leaders and those who are gonna do training. They should define what it is that paints the picture of what your company does and how it does it. They should be clear and effective. Uh, every business needs to have a mission. Um, a mission becomes a, a goal, a target. It, uh, you know, if you were, Target practicing without a target, it'd be kind of hard to hit the bullseye, wouldn't it? So in this sense, if you create a mission that's real, that's just not like tickling your ears with pretty words that you put on your website, but you actually develop a mission that you're gonna drive towards, that helps your entire team move towards that mission and it will impact or really define your business culture. That's, that's my view. So what's our mission? Our mission is to deliver best in class facility maintenance services to our clients by a powerful people first business culture that protects and develops frontline workers. That's, that is what our mission is at East Coast. That, and if you follow our content or if you spend any amount of time with me, you'll see it tonight, but I am extremely passionate about frontline workers. It is why I wake up every day and do what I do for work because I have a host of other investments that are not in this industry and I live and breathe this industry because of the frontline workforce. So it is inherently engraved, etched, defined in our mission statement. Get together either as an owner, if you're a small business owner, think about what your mission is. What is your goal? What is your mission? What are you in business for? If, it's, if your mission is um, provide adequate uh, uh, financial protection for my wife and children and be home on the weekends so that we can go hunting or fishing or this or that, write, write that down because that's what you need to drive towards. You don't need to write some fancy mission. But as a, a, an organization, if you have more people involved and if you're not just a, an owner with a, um, a, a more concise circle that you impact, well, maybe you need to consider what is the mission of the collective company or what is the, the vision or the goal of the stakeholders of the company. So I think, uh, I think establishing a mission is, is, is awesome because it really helps you drive towards something. That's our mission. That is, that is our mission as a family and as a company. So when we're bringing in new talent, managers, uh, supervisors, leaders, people in business development, we could have a really, really strong um, business developer come in who we know can sell and book work, but they just may not fit. Our, our ecosystem because they're not aligned with what our mission is. Because if you're with, with us, if you're, if you're not here, that, in, that doesn't, you, you don't fit, and it doesn't fit with ECF. There's a lot of other places to be where that's not the priority, all right? Uh, this gentleman here, uh, Charles, his nickname is Bobcat. His, uh, his tenure batch has flipped to 10 plus now. He was probably at nine years in that picture. He's been with me for 10 plus years. He's Haitian, he's um, 70 years old, and he's a groundsman on an Arbor crew. He's a monster, he's a great guy. Uh, Jose, actually a year ago, he was with me for seven years, and he 
retired and he started a small business on the side. He had, had really bad knees. But these are my people. So these are the people I'm passionate about. I could tell you a story about every single one of them. Okay? So what's your mission? Determine what it is. Make sure it's a real mission. Think about it, right? Don't go, don't go target practicing and try to hit a bullseye and there's not a target. Put the target up first. Workforce development. When a business becomes expert at developing talent instead of hiring talent, the sustainability of the business exponentially increases. If you want to develop your workforce, you must first have the will to do so. Then you must build training systems and allocate resources. Always be training. This is a picture of two team members training other members of our team on operating liquid de-icing rig, a liquid de-icing rig. That's what they're doing. They're training. Okay. I think, and I've done it. I've done it in the past as a business owner. I think we make um, a big mistake where we're out looking for talent. I think that's a mistake. It's great if you can find talent and acquire talent. Uh, that's a good thing. But I think you need to hire people who have a passion for what you're doing, um, who have an interest in the field, uh, or whatever it is, whether they're, it's business development, whatever, whatever it is, uh, whether they're in the finance team or they're, they're in the field, people who want to do that job or want to learn about that job and develop those people. And if you can develop people internally, you have a huge advantage in the staffing issues that, people are, that we're all having in, in these days across the board. If you don't have an ecosystem that develops people, you are absolutely at a disadvantage because now you're looking for the 1% club of, of, of talented people that are out there that can plug and play and get in a bucket truck. So in Florida, we, we have Arbor Crews, we trim trees year round. You know, palms need to be trimmed twice a year, hardwoods at least once a year. Tree trimming down there is like trimming shrubs up here, you know? So we got bucket crews and that takes time to learn how to trim, to code, how to run those crew, how to run those trucks, meet all of our safety standards, meet all of OSHA's standards. You, you try pulling a guy off the street right now who can do that work, you know, and that'll last in 90 degree Florida, South Florida weather. So what we do is, is as soon as somebody becomes proficient at that work, we grab another team member and start putting them into the training cycle. So we're not exposed because we're developing that talent internally. And, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I've seen it, like, like our, our agronomic technicians who can run the Z sprays and know how to, know how to dose tanks and know how to spread, uh, at put, do proper spread rates and know how to you know, um, apply the right you know, chemical to the right situation. I mean, that, that takes a tremendous amount of experience and talent. You can't just hire someone off the street and put them in that position. So what do you do? Well, it's easy to always send the guy who knows how to do it to do it. Instead of hiring somebody else and attaching them at the hip with the guy who knows how to do it so you can develop that person. It's just easier just to send the guy who knows. Send the guy who knows. Well, guess what? What if he's not here tomorrow? And we make that mistake. We do what's easy today and we pay for it tomorrow because we're not developing our people. So that's, that's something internally that we challenge ourselves with and we fight with. Um, and that's top, top down, right? So I'm constantly challenging our directors. Who are you developing? Tell me who you're developing. Who are, you, who are you developing for this? Who are you developing for that? And they name names. Well, this person, that person. And sometimes we train a person and they leave. It happens. We train someone, they become really, really good. And for whatever reason, they, they jump for some money or uh, they move out of the market or, or something happens, they leave. Well, that doesn't mean we change our, our standard to develop people. We don't change. We don't change. And if you, if you do that for long enough, you'll look back and you'll say, holy shit, look what I built. That's what's going to happen. Workforce development. Extremely important. You're, stop looking outside the house. Look inside the house first. Develop people. Don't be afraid to develop people. Don't be afraid to invest in people. You're investing in yourself. That's what you're doing. Uh, this is a video that gives you a sneak peek of internal development. And we, we had a, you know, a day where we were just, we were doing some, some um, 
medical certifications for drivers. Um, I, we were doing uh, some training before the winter in a service center. And so we brought the media, our media team in and they just kind of captured the day. So it's just a video to show just an idea of like what we're doing internally in East Coast to invest in our people. We're constantly investing and developing our people. Pay close attention to the lady who is trying to learn how to use a snow raider. I have a comment to make after about that, all right? The comment that I want to make about the, the lady, one of my team members, her name is Olympia, by the way. She is from Honduras. She was being trained how to operate the, the snow raider. You saw her by the cones? And she still can't operate a snow raider. It's hard. She's afraid of it. She's a tremendous uh, team member. She works so hard. She's capable of so many things. So I want to ask you what you think. Do you think we're done trying to help her to learn how to operate the snow raider? Do you think we're gonna give up because she doesn't know how to operate the snow raider? Of course not, right? It's the easy answer. But this is the way you have to think. So come next fall, she's gonna be in the front of the line and we're gonna to try to help her to, to learn how to operate the equipment. Um, and we owe that to her. And if she never learns, that's okay. Because she is in a technician role where she is supposed to be cross-trained in some of those things. So we're just gonna keep trying. Okay, and so it's okay, right? If you have team members that you just can't, they just, they can't figure it out or they're afraid or they're timid or it's, it's not a good fit for them, just keep trying to help them. Keep trying to help them. Uh, old, old saying, if you have a dull axe, just keep chopping wood, the tree will come down eventually, right? It's okay. It's, 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 it's okay for it not to be perfect. It's fine. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. Now, um, the next big rock issue to me is Customer service. Customer service, uh, it's, it's a huge piece of making sure that your operations run fluidly. And of course, it's an important aspect of uh, building your business. Customer service is building meaningful relationships with clients. Um, you, I don't know if you've ever attended like sales seminars or um, you know, things like that, and they say, you know, if you want to have a great client, make a friend. I mean, that's, and that's true, but we don't necessarily go out on the weekends with our clients necessarily. Some do. Um, we don't necessarily invite them to our kids' birthday parties or this or that. Uh, but we do build meaningful relationships with them at work. Some clients, there could be exceptions where they are actually close friends. But generally speaking, we want to build meaningful relationships with customers. How do we do it? Well, we have to be engaging with our, with our clients. I think that for operations to run fluidly, you have to surround yourself with a group of customers that appreciate what you're doing for them and um, repel customers that do not appreciate what you're doing for them. And uh, Josh, you can put this on LinkedIn, a nice sound bite for you. You can, and I'm here to tell you that you can fire customers, fire them. If they're not good, fire them. 
because you'll have a bad customer that you just cannot develop a good relationship with and they will take up 80% of your time. And there's, there's not a good customer, not a good fit for you. So it's okay to say to that type of a customer, hey, it, we're sure it's us, but it's obvious we're just not a good fit. And that's okay. And we've had to exit customers over the years. Um, and we will in the years to come, that's okay. The expression that the customer is always right is a lie. That is not true. I'll tell you right now, it's not true. They are not always right. You guys are experts. Now, you're not gonna walk up to the customer and say, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, right? You're gonna like build the relationship, say, hey, Bob or Jane or whoever you are, let me help you. A relationship will let you do that. So customer service and building good relationships by how? Solving the customer's problems, making their life easy. Property managers and asset managers. We work with property managers, asset managers, facility managers. We work with. Now we, for sales, sometimes we're working with procurement and corporate buyers, which is detached from their people on the ground that we work with. But these are the people we work with. Property managers, asset managers, facility managers, okay? They are as busy as you and I are. Don't think for a minute that their life revolves around landscape, snow, any of that. It doesn't. They're extremely busy. So my recommendation is, is talk to them. <laughs> talk to them, engage them, and or, and or observe and find out how you actually can make their life easier, how you can save time for them. Great customer service is making their life easy and solving problems for them. If you want to bring donuts and coffee and this and that, great. That's, not, that's nice. But great customer service is solving their problems and making their life easy. And if you can create allies with customers where they're going to back you up, they're going to support you, they're going to appreciate when you do that for them, you can scale and grow a business. Big as you want. Big as you want. And don't be afraid to fire a customer. And the customer is not always right. Tell them when they're wrong in a loving way. Give them a hug first. Be fine. Okay? Forward thinking business practices. Uh, this is where I get to pick on Brightview a little bit. And private equity. Uh, we must provide our managers with the resources they need to execute service delivery. We cannot handicap them because we want a Ferrari in a garage or because we want to make the investors happy and whole. Owners must constantly be reinvesting profits into the business so it can be refined and continue to grow. So the challenge, this is something, this is where the locally owned or the wholly owned companies rule. So I'll tell you a difference between Brightview and Landcare. Landcare has partners. Brightview is publicly traded. Those partners are not necessarily going to recapitalize that business in seven years. And there's no uh, quarterly reports, tail, I call it the tail wagging the dog, or the 90-day football is what I call it. They can be a lot more agile with their decision making. They can do a lot more reinvestment into their teams. Now, that's not to say that Brightview doesn't have some seriously kick-ass branches in this country, because they do. And I know some of them. And I also know the ones that are weak. But publicly traded and private equity, my opinion, they are at a disadvantage because they're largely driven by numbers because they're investment vehicles for, pe for the people who are in control. All of our business are investment vehicles, but as locally, regional, wholly owned companies, we can play the long game. We don't have to show a profit this quarter or that quarter. It's okay if one fiscal year our numbers are lower because we've invested for the next fiscal year. That's okay. So we have to, I highly recommend we be forward thinking in our business practices. We invest for the long term. Me, I'm not thinking in months. And I am not thinking in years. I am thinking in decades. And that's like very rare in our industry to be thinking in decades. I think in decades. Take, take, use that to your advantage if you're a smaller operator or you're building or growing your business. 
be forward thinking. Don't squander your cash or if you have a great year right now, I hope we're all making money because the economy is raging. Don't squander it. Use it to your advantage. As you, you, you get wins, save some of that money or reinvest it into your business and use it to become formidable competition because some of these other companies, they're, they're decisioning for now. They need numbers and returns now. That's okay, that, that's their business model. It is what it is. But if that's not your business model, you have an advantage. I have an advantage over these types of companies because I'm, I'm thinking long term in how I, I'm investing. I'm knowing, oh, my cash flow is gonna be down for three years because I'm building my fleet. What happens three years later? As, as a lot of that debt burden gets paid down, my cash flow improves, but I think that way. Uh, so that has been a, that's been something that's been massive for us is way before East Coast Facilities started, I was rolling my profits into my company year over year. And when I sold off my prior business, instead of moving on with my life, I took that and I bankrolled ECF and capitalized it in a way that a privately owned company normally wouldn't be capitalized. And then I used that to hedge against my risk so I could go. And I went. So we're making money. We make money, but we just keep rolling it in, rolling it into our company and improving it. So those are the big rock issues that I just wanted to cover here um, with this first part of our discussion tonight for sec successful operations. This is just a recap slide. Discipline, I, I, ch I need to challenge myself to be more disciplined all the time. I think discipline is something we really need to focus on. It's like the bedrock to everything else. If we're disciplined, a lot of other things can fall into place. Consistency. It's great if you have an idea, it's great if you deploy a new system, you institute a standard into your business, but it's gotta be consistent. Don't teach your guys, oh, this is really important, and then two weeks later you teach them it's not so important because you're not doing it anymore. Be consistent, be consistent. So in fact, actually, I didn't mention this before, don't even start something if you're not gonna be consistent. Don't even start it, wait. Then implement it into your, into your business and then be consistent about it. Right? It's like, like if you're going to start working out and go to the gym, don't start unless you're going to go. Just wait. Make, and then when you go, go. By the way, if you work out, I found if you work out 90 days, 90 day period consistently over 90 days, you stay in the gym. You'll be good. Consistency. Standards. Build and develop standards that are simple and effective for your business and memorialize those standards in memorandums or an operations manual or something so that those standards can be well known and taught to new team members, new employees that come into your business. Have a mission. Don't go target practicing and try to hit the bullseye without a target. Build your mission. What's your mission? Pick a real mission, not fancy words. It doesn't make sense. What is your mission? Drive your mission. Have your team drive it with you. Develop your people, develop talent internally. Stop looking for the needle in the haystack. You have the haystack. Turn them all into needles. That's it. Customer service. Uh, build meaningful relationships. Don't be afraid to fire a bad customer. And the customer is not always right. You can tell them I said so. Blame it on me. They're not always right. All right? Surround yourself with good customers. And if that means you grow slower or more methodically, that's fine. You're going to make more money. You're going to lose less hair. You're going to sleep better. Your life's going to be better. You're going to enjoy life. Forward thinking business practices, 90 day footballs, 90 day football or seven year recapitalization. Everything is about generating as much profit and cash flow because in seven years we recapitalize and sell this business. That's what private equity is. I don't know if you guys understand how private equity works. There's a platform. A platform comes in. They buy out a bunch of other companies. They merge together. I call it slap together all these cultures, and over a seven year period of time, they take a $10 million company, turn it into a $100 million company, and the original owners and investors recapitalize or sell it off. So everything that happens in that seven years is meant to drive numbers, drive numbers, drive numbers, because they need to show an improvement in the numbers for when they sell it, resell it. That's a seven year recap, summer five, summer seven, summer 12. That's how private equity works. Um, 
we've been approached like 18 times for private equity to sell already. So we haven't done it yet. I don't think we will. That's our recap. Um, we're gonna now just, I'll just show you a video. Um, for some of you who haven't really seen content on our snow operations, I'll close it out with a video. When this video wraps up, I think we're gonna do, we're gonna do like a, like a 10 minute break, bathroom break or something, let's do that. So I'll close it out with a video uh, and then y'all can just grab some bathroom break or stretch your legs or whatever and then I'll come up here and bother you again about recruiting, okay? Actually, I'll explain this video, sorry. This video is, uh, uh, well, I won't explain this slide because this slide is actually for, really was for a specific company, but I'm not gonna explain that right now, not up here. Um, but this video is actually a shipping snow fleet to one of our largest sites, six and a half million square foot site, and every piece of equipment in here is going to one site, so it's kind of neat. Let's talk about recruiting. <clears throat> Not everybody's in here, but I'll take a poll here. Um, I'm curious, I'm curious to know out of everyone that's here, how many of you are, are fully staffed right now? 100% fully staffed, okay? And let me do another, another opposite. Um, how many of you have greater than 15% uh, shortfall in staffing, greater than 15%. That means one and a half, right out there, okay. What do you think, Is it, what about 10%? Is that more, one out of 10 seats you're missing? What's your shortfall, who had a hit, what is it? Ballpark. Oh, your H2B is in here? Oh, you got lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Okay, um, how, many, how many have ge generally have issues staffing and keeping staff with quality people? Is that, nobody, five people? Come on, yeah? All right, let me ask the question again, but you guys have to tell the truth, otherwise I'm gonna go home. How many have challenges in staffing with qualified personnel? All right, so. So you're like me. I mean, because we all do, even, I mean, we do. Um, a, two months ago, I could tell you we were fully staffed, but right now we're not fully staffed because now we're going into the spring in the north and we need to add personnel. And in Florida, our Florida market's growing crazy. So we have a little bit of an issue there, but we'll, we'll get there. We're gonna talk about, uh, I call it the recruiting game. How, what we do, what we do at ECF to staff 
and to stay staffed with quality personnel. Now, some of that I revealed in the prior set of slides where we talked about, about certain things that would affect our, our, our ecosystem, the culture of our business, that would affect um, things like retention. We talked about developing talent, right? So we're gonna dig into it more in this segment, what, what I call the recruiting game. In order to be fully staffed, these are like the big rock items as, as I see them, okay? Employee retention is item number one. Reputation, item number two. Man margins and cash flow, I'm gonna explain why that even relates. What does your margins and your cash flow have to do with staffing? I'll explain. Brand reach, applicant workflow, onboarding workflow. These are the six issues that I would like to discuss here in the next maybe half hour or so, all right? Uh, I don't know if I was going too fast in the first segment. Was, is that okay, that pace, or? All right, because I'm from the Northeast, so I, I'm from New Jersey and Pennsylvania area, and uh, I talk fast, so. Employee retention, let's start there. Uh, you must retain employees and retain your customers. If you do not retain your employees, you will not grow or generate profits. Employee retention to me is critical in business. Critical, critical, critical. And when you're building your business and your culture of your business, you're building what, what I call an ecosystem or you're developing your body because a body has a lot of parts. You have fingers and toes and nose and ears. All independent, but they all function together as a body. It's like a business. So I have this thought for you. Build an ecosystem that creatures survive and thrive in and a body that vomits the shit out. Okay? And I'll explain it. We call it our ecosystem. We want our ecosystem to be the type of business culture or the business environment, the environment that our team members can survive and thrive in. They can grow or they can stay where they are in their comfortable space and they're comfortable and they're happy and they enjoy what they do. It's, it's, it's an ecosystem. It's a place where they survive and thrive. But we also want to have the standards, the disciplines in place, the policies in place. We want to develop our body in such a way that if something poisonous enters the ecosystem, if a bad apple gets in or a person with a rotten, cancerous attitude, that our ecosystem <clears throat> vomits them out automatically. Like we don't even have to fire them because it's just uncomfortable for them because they're like, I don't belong here. This, th this doesn't fit me. So I like this. A body that vomits the shit out. Now, don't use that as an excuse to lose good people that you didn't develop and train because that's what can happen. But there are some bad, bad apples out there, some nasty people out there. Don't get confused between the two. What leads to retention? Effective interviewing and selection. You say, well, there's, who am I selecting from? I have one seat to fill and one person showed up, one body showed up. <laughs> we'll, get it, we'll get to that. Effective interviewing and selection, onboarding practices, development, we covered that, right? Developing our team members. I showed you a little video on developing. Company culture, work environment. Let me explain the difference, your culture and your work environment. Um, you have a, like a really good company culture, owner's nice, a um, lot of work, I get paid well, but my work environment is like, I'm getting in a, like a, what are those old, you know, those really, really old wheel loaders you see on some sites are from the 70s, and just the work environment's not very comfortable, you know? It's like, I've seen companies that have a work environment that just is not comfortable for people to work in. So that matters. It does matter. Uh, does the employee like their boss? I, I actually think that should be maybe even be close to the top of the list. You know, people work for who they like. But if you're an owner and you have managers or leaders in places to manage people, right? And they're not nice, and the people that are working for them don't like them, they're not gonna stay. It doesn't matter how nice you are as an owner, because you're not interacting with them all the time. Does the employee like their boss, whoever they report to and work with regularly? You might wanna look into it. I do, because we have to check, we have to 
help our, our leaders internally sometimes to make sure they're likable, right? They have pressure, they could take it out on somebody inadvertently, That's, you gotta be careful with that. Pay and benefits at the bottom. Yes, they matter, but I promise you, you can pay people a billion dollars, give them a shitty boss, give them a poor work environment, give them a bad culture, hire them and throw them to the wolves and it doesn't matter how much you pay them. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, okay? So don't, don't just try to throw money at it. That's not enough. Not gonna work. Um, in developing, in developing your, your team and in, in, in preserving a good culture and building an ecosystem, in retaining employees, you have to address issues and problems as they come up. I have an expression I use often internally. My team can finish the sentence for me. If I say, don't walk, they'll tell you past problems. Don't walk past problems. You have problems internally? We do. You do. Address it as you go. Now, you don't have to like address everything every moment, but you see, you see a pattern develop in a business. You see something develop maybe in your business or in one of your branches, if there's branches involved, and you got to address it. So I had a situation a few years ago where I had some, uh, one particular person, but there were really two involved, but they, these were leaders, managers, and they had bad attitudes. They just, they just did not, they just had bad attitudes. And they were part of the original crop when we first started building the business, so they were in place. And uh, actually, you'd laugh if I told you who they went to work for. It was, it was, let's put it this way, it was a good fit. They ended up being a good fit where they went to work. They had an impact on the workforce. They, they, their bad attitude, just their, the way they conduct them that was impacting our workforce. And I had veteran crew leaders working at this location because they came from my, my old company, came to work with me again. And I saw people that I knew that I managed myself and that I never had an issue with start to do things and say things and, and be a way that I never saw before because like a cancer had entered that business unit. So what do you do with that? Um, well, your goal is to retain people. Before you try to hire anyone else, you gotta focus on retention. And so what I did in this particular case was we developed a specialized uh, training for all of these crew leaders. And I came in and I spent a whole morning with them. I had three modules and then we took everybody out to lunch. And I put pictures of the old days up and pictures of us at barbecues together and playing soccer. I said, this is who we are, man. And we're getting away from it. What's going on? And we did illustrations. And you know, I, one illustration I did for them was I said, you know, I put a cup, a, a cup of water on the table. I said, who would drink the water? And they all said, I would drink the water. Okay, now I have poison. I took out an eyedropper. It was red dye, food dye, but I told them it was poison. And I put a dot, drop of dye in and you know, it went in the water. I said, okay, now who's gonna drink the water? Nobody wants to drink the water. I said, that's, that's the poison. That's the bad attitude entering our business. So I helped them, right? I was teaching them. And then a year later, we followed up. And the first thing we did was give them a lot of commendation because this team like improved dramatically. I mean, noticeably improved. And so this is just a clip from the follow-up where we were giving them, we were doubling down and giving them more training. And it's an example of where you stop, you, you collectively determine what you need to address or how you can help your team reactively, but preferably proactively. And we stopped and we addressed some things. And what I was talking about here is, is like, appreciate what you have, guys. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. So just a quick example of the effort made to retain people, retain them and work with them. It's human nature to sometimes be focused on what you don't have versus what you do have. I noticed as the business owner that, to be honest, that there were very, very poor attitudes in this service center a year ago. But we think that after that training and after that discussion that the crew leaders appreciated the reminder. And that was evident because during the year last year, we saw the attitudes 
and the positive attitudes start to change. So um, one point that I'll make for all of you is that uh, the company cannot solve all your problems in your life. We cannot um, make decisions for you and we cannot unmake decisions you already made in your lives. But what we do is we provide a good place to work, fair pay, fair benefits, fair treatment. That's what we provide. It's important to, if you're going to work here anywhere, anywhere for that matter, appreciate what you have. I like, I like the idea of stopping and I like the idea of not walking past problems and doing it in a way that's um, compassionate and helpful for your people. Make sure they feel like you care about them. Make sure, they, make sure your tone and how you address it with people who wake up at the crack of dawn to get ready for work, to go to their probably non-union job, work their ass off in the field all day, and they're just, many of them just surviving. So you gotta, we gotta think about that stuff when we're coaching and when we're dealing with issues. But our goal has to be to retain people. And we retain them with training. We retain them by addressing issues as they come up and not letting things boil over. This is just an example of doing that. So you saw, it was like a, like a training, it was in one of our training rooms, classroom setting, stop the music. They're all on the clock and they're all being compensated to be, they're going to school, they're going to university, they're being coached. It's life lessons. This is soft skills training, by the way, is what we call it. So that is retention. I wanted to comment, I wanted to speak about retention and how important retention is as the priority. Let's talk about reputation. Your company's reputation on the street is, with the working class is more important than your reputation is with any specific client. I promise you that's true if you need the staff. You know, sometimes people say, um, well, you, you know, who are your clients? I do business with Amazon, I do business with, you don't, you don't do business with Amazon. Just so you guys know, nobody does business with Amazon. You do business with Bob, who works at Amazon today, and tomorrow he's at who knows where, right? You don't do business with Amazon, all right? So customers, like, they come and they go, and they move to other markets, they move to other industries. I mean, how many of your customers are jumping seats from company to company right now? People are like all over the place. Your employees who are there, who are working for your company day after day, year after year, hopefully, decade after decade, if you're super awesome, your reputation with them and what they share on the street is extremely important. Extremely important. Don't make the mistake of thinking about your reputation from a customer's perspective. That's good and that's important. Of course it's important. But then we take our eye off the ball and we don't think, what is our reputation with not just our employees, but our past employees? If, if you don't have a good reputation, generally speaking, with past employees, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. So when, when, <coughs> when people move on from your company, I hope it's because, and my company, let me, re, let, me, let me reword that. When people move on from my company, I hope it's because they're moving up, not just out. They started a business, they learned enough, they want to start their business, I love it. They are changing industries, they're moving to a new town, um, they're pursuing an education dream, they're, moving, they're retiring and going back to their country. They're not leaving because a manager, they felt like they were being degraded by a manager that felt like uh, they were oppressing them for some racist motivation or bigoted motivation or not appreciating their hard work or whatever, right? Your reputation matters. If you want to recruit, you better have a good reputation. Key question, do you lose employees to competitors in the same market? We lose very few employees to competitors in markets where we operate, very few. Does it happen? Yes. But a lot of times they're switching industries, they're moving out of town, something like that. So maybe that's a goal when we talk about the recruiting game, we talk about retention is, what, what kind of reputation do you wanna build on the street? It matters how you treat your people and it matters what they think of you. So if you could do a really good job to part ways nicely with people who don't work for you anymore, that, that's awesome. I hired a, um, 
it, it's, I can't name the name because it's not the public company. But I hired a crew leader from a company, big company in Florida. I didn't, but the company did. Hired him from a very large company, national company in Florida. And then a friend of mine who works for that company texted me and said, hey, that crew leader you hired, he doesn't have the best attitude. And I said to my friend, I said, then why was he working there for seven years? He didn't have a good attitude, so when he le as soon as he left, well, then he was, he was no good, right? As soon as he left. But they kept him for seven years, right? Well, there, that, there's something wrong with that mindset. Why is he there for seven years then? So we don't, we don't want to have that kind of reputation on the street where people leave our business and they're, they're talking bad about us because how are we going to recruit? How are we going to go out after the working class in the market if we do that to our reputation? So I think it's something to think about. Um, here's an interview with a gentleman, works up in um, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, and um, he, he's a seasonal snow operator, and he was interviewed, and we used this cut for recruiting last season, or going into last season, but this gentleman brought us, you know, five, six, seven other operators because of how he was treated, and operators, skilled operators are not easy to come by, right? So just take a look. How long have I worked at East Coast Facilities? This is gonna be my start of my third season. And um, this will be my third exciting season to be here. What do I like most about working at East Coast Facilities? I believe that the utmost and first thing that I like is that you're treated like a person. You're not treated like a number. The site supervisors tell you what to do and expect you to do things and they leave you alone to do your thing. They're not constantly telling you what to do. They trust your instincts and they trust your operating skills. What kind of equipment do I like? I like the case. I like the case because it's very responsive. It's easy to operate. It's a luxury to operate. Um, as far as the machine itself, it's powerful pushes snow, lifts snow. You can't ask for a better piece of equipment. And I cannot complain about the, the machines themselves because everything is pretty much brand new. And that's the way it always is here. Whether it's three years old or brand new, it's brand new. How important is safety to East Coast facilities? It is their number one priority. They do not push you beyond your limits. If you need a break, you take a break. If you need to use the bathroom, you use the bathroom. They never ask you to do anything that would not meet the standards for a site. And there is nothing that they ask you to do that would put anybody or anything in jeopardy. Why would I recommend East Coast facilities? Number one, fair pay. Number two, checks are on time. Number three, fair working conditions, great equipment, and an excellent place to work. No, Case did not pay us for the plug, by the way. Um, but we do appreciate it. Yeah, um, that, that was all, I mean, that was unscripted. That was just his, his words. Um, but all of you have people that you work with that would say, similar things about you and about your business. There are people that you work with that you take great care of, that are great advocates for you today. Uh, I, would, I just included this as a reminder to say, let's, let's take it from some or many to all. Let's take it from the ones who work with us today to the ones who used to work with us. Because I think it just puts you in a really powerful position to, to staff your business. Margins and cash flow, what the heck does this have to do with recruiting? Well, if you don't price work properly, put this down so I can use my hands properly. If you don't price your work properly, that's not an issue in our industry, right? Everybody prices work properly. All the national companies do. If you don't price your work properly, a couple things happen. Um, operations is in a meat grinder. 
and big operators know if you have a, a job or a task that should take 40 man hours, four guys a 10 hour day, and a sales clown prices it at 20, the only person that pays for that are the people in the field and the operators on the ground. And they can't get the work done and the customer's screaming and you, know, and you gotta ghost applications, uh, turf applications, and you gotta value engineer, it's stealing by the way, value engineer work to get it done. It just, I see, <laughs> right? We know, right? That's a problem. Uh, your ability to accurately price work and manage your cash will directly impact your ability to retain and recruit employees. Um, because if you don't have enough cash or cash flow in a business or you haven't priced work properly, you aren't going to have the resources you need to pay properly, to give the right benefits. Um, and we're, we're, we're largely a non-union industry, which by the way, and I'm, not, I'm actually politically neutral, I'm not affiliated with any political party when I make this statement, but I would love to see our industry go union because the work that our guys do for the wages they get paid at non-union rates is freaking ridiculous in my opinion, okay? Um, thank you. So, and that's actually going to become my mission here soon in the coming years. Uh, but if work isn't priced properly, people can't be compensated fairly. They, they can't get the benefits that they need. You know, my goal is to give more benefits, more protection, not to create lazy people. And by the way, unions can create lazy people if they have bad leadership. And I don't know, it's tough, right? It's like a double-edged sword. But it's important that work gets priced properly. And it's also important that if you're making money and you have cash flow and you're a business owner, that parking a 911 Porsche Turbo in your garage doesn't become more important than taking care of your frontline workforce. So that's why I have it separated, margins and cash flow. You might have great margins, have great, you might not have great cash flow because you're, you're taking the cash out of the business. Okay? Now, I, I said 911 Turbo because I have a beautiful 911 Turbo in Miami and I keep it down there. And I'm, gonna tell you, I'm not bragging to you, I'm gonna tell you why I'm sharing this with you. People say to me, and, and it's a good point, they say, well, what do your people think when you come into the service center with a 911 Turbo, beautiful car, expensive car. And I say nothing because they all are treated fairly, they're all paid well, they have the best benefits in the market and they congratulate me because they know I'm one of them. And that, with the American dream, working hard, I worked hard and after 30 some years in business, that's what I have as a toy. So I'm not saying there's something wrong with the Porsche 911 Turbo or the Ferrari or the this or the that, that's fine but not at the expense of the workforce. And we have to price work properly because if we don't price it properly with the right margins, we don't give enough resources to operations to get the work done. We don't have enough resources to properly compensate and pay our workforce. So don't be weak and underpriced work. Price work properly, know your numbers. Operate like, you know, like a professional operator and you're gonna have what you need you're gonna have what you need to retain your employees and attract new employees to your business. Make sense? Okay. Brand reach. Brands are not as necessary to acquire new clients as they are to acquire new talent. Now, I think that applies to our industry. I don't think it applies to all industries. I think most of us if we want a cola, we'll reach out for a Coca-Cola before we reach out for a who knows what cola, generally speaking, because it's just so well branded. It's a bit different with consumer products, but when it comes to our business, the service industry, our brand isn't all that important. It's really not, because I could name my company Mickey Mouse Landscaping, and I could sell a lot of work, because it's relationship driven, right? So, I, I, it, it does matter for client acquisition, but not as much for employees. What does your brand stand for? What do people think when they see that brand? Oh, the checks aren't always there on Friday. Oh, they don't want to pay overtime. They only want to, they only want to pay us cash, not overtime. Uh, they don't give overtime. They don't have benefits. The benefits suck. There's no contribution to the 401k. I don't know, whatever it is. What, is your, what do they think of when they see your brand? Oh, there's racist people there. No, we don't, I don't wanna, we don't wanna work there. We're not gonna work there because those managers, they're racist. And by the way, as a person who's from a, from a Hispanic minority, 
I think minorities, us minorities, we default to things are racist when they aren't necessarily. But we could, we could hear, sit here and say, oh, this guy thinks I'm being racist, and you're not. But what you need to care about is why does he think that and how do you adjust his thinking to help him, right? So what, is, what, what kind of reputation, what, kind of, what does your brand mean? What is your brand, how is your brand going to impact people when they see it? Now, I have three things over here on the side. I got a full logo. I've got the icon. It's called an icon. It's pulled out of the logo, so it could be used separately. And I have a Somos Uno uh, logo, which in Spanish is We Are One, which is a campaign we were working on to unite the Hispanic workforce. Go on LinkedIn and put the hashtag Somos Uno. It's a building. Um, same idea, but that brand means something. In the markets we operate, that Somos Uno means something. The Hispanic community, they know what it means. Trust me. What's your brand mean on the street? And how much of a reach does your brand have? So if you can associate your company or your image or your brand with doing good works for the community, with your employees, meaningful from your heart projects, and working with people and, and diversifying and and building bridges and not walls and things like that, your, your, your brand is gonna attract people. You're gonna attract people. It's up to you how you build and do that. What does your brand mean to me as a potential worker? That gentleman, uh, um, Dwayne, when he first came to work for us, he told me and a group of my, peer, my fellow managers, he said, I saw the ad and then I went online and looked you guys up and I saw all of your employee first culture or content spelled out on YouTube. He's a baby boomer. He knows exactly how to use the internet and exactly how to go to YouTube. But he saw what our brand stood for. Like our, our content isn't tell, oh, we're the best at plowing snow and we, we recommend you plant this tree here and you fertilize this. Our content's all people, people, people driven. So people can identify with that. So it helps us to recruit. So what's your brand stand for? I would suggest we not only build a brand for customer acquisition, we build a brand for talent acquisition. Think about it. It's worth thinking about. Um, this is a, an example of content that would go out where we're trying to acquire talent. So in this content, this is what I think the messaging is. This is the idea of the messaging. Hey, come work for us because we're very cool. We have really good equipment. We've got great job sites. Um, and we're the best. So that's the idea, right? Real quick. Now, the music is for like a wide demographic, but I could take the same cut and I could put country music on it for a certain demographic. I can put uh, some type of you know, Hispanic music on it if I wanted to. I could put all types of music behind it to attack certain demographics depending on the market, okay? But in general, it's what we're building in our content. It's the messaging. And it's telling a recruit or a person, hey, this is, that's the company I want to work for, right? We're building a brand to attract the talent. All right, so that spot would go largely on Facebook, promoted ads, right? And that's what we call a hook. 
Facebook ads, Instagram, LinkedIn, but the first two, more important for the workforce. LinkedIn's more for middle management, sales, marketing to B2B to clients, and supplier support or networking. LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram. So like in the winter, to give you an idea, our ads spend uh, almost $40,000 a month in the winter, uh, preceding the winter and going through the winter to recruit talent to fill all of our seats for all of our equipment. All right, serious ad spend, but we have the content to back it up. So we throw a whole bunch of hooks in the water with all type of digital content. And what I'm gonna get into next is the applicant workflow and why it's important. So build a brand that attracts talent. Not just eye candy, but it build a brand that means something. Your reputation on the street, right? You retain your employees, how you, how you treat them, how you develop them. How's your reputation? How good is your reputation with people who don't work for you anymore? Build a brand that means something. Now we're using very um, sophisticated content. We, as far as I know, we have the best, largest media team in our, in our industry and we're a small company to have a media team like that because I believe Content creation and media and capturing what we're doing is a better investment than business development because business development for us, we don't really need too much of it because we don't lose our customers and we have customers coming. So instead of allocating it to a huge business development team, we put a lot of it into media. So uh, last year internally almost $400,000 in spend just on content creation, all right? A lot of hooks out there. We can, I, we can go into any market and flip switches and just dump it with content. We're doing it in West Palm Beach right now. We're just dumping content in, getting in talent, and then comes the applicant process. All right, let's talk about it. Applicant workflow. First objective is to cast the net wide and fill it with fish, like a huge fishing trawler with a huge net. More people to pick from, the better. Your second objective is to sift through the catch and keep the quality. So here's what the problem is. We don't bring enough fish in to pick out the quality. The sushi, the sushi grade, right? We, well, we got, three, we got three open spots, a guy walks through the door, okay? You're in, you know? Can you drive? Yeah, you drive? Habla inglés? <laughs> None of you are allowed to say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, establish a solid applicant workflow that your administrative team can support. If you're the owner, you're the administrative team. It's cool, it's fine, I've been there. Here's the process. Applicant, someone applies for the job. They're sitting in this bucket and after being reviewed, maybe at a, not 30,000 foot view, maybe 15,000 foot view, you look at their application, may, maybe their resume, a lot of the field jobs don't need a resume. Application, take a look at it. They can become a candidate. Put them into the candidate bucket. They get an actual interview by a hiring manager. Once hired, or once the hiring manager wants to hire them, we do, I'm summing it up as investigate and verify. So there are things that we do internally. So this is amazing. You will not believe this, this is a true statement. All of our employees are, are, are background checked across the board, even seasonal operators, they're all on the payroll. And they all have to pass drug screens. So all of our heavy equipment operators will pass drug screens. And as of today, that includes marijuana, as of today. That's in discussions right now, marijuana, in our company. We're discussing it. But as of today, even with marijuana in there, it's a drug-free workplace, okay? <clears throat> um, and when I get to questions at the end, I have nothing else to say about the marijuana topic right now. I'm just saying, because you know, things get caught in time and then three months from now we have a policy change. Uh, offer, you make an offer, they accept, you hire and you onboard. That's the workflow. Now I put up here an app that we use for years called Hireology. So when you put up all these ads, people can click a link and that link would dump them into this recruiting software where they're in the applicant bucket it, it, it digitally and it has all their, their application, their resume, everything is in there and you can take them through a lot of this process and manage it 
and delegate it so you don't lose track of people. I love it, it's not that expensive, it works great. Now we're migrating out of that because we're moving into a much more comprehensive system that's attached to other things now. But I, I, there are apps like that that you can get to manage your applicant workflow. And I really like Hireology. Technically, we're still on it. So if you go to our careers page and you look at all the jobs that are there, it's attached to Hireology. Hireology manages that. Not that expensive, okay? Uh, so that's your applicant workflow. You gotta have a workflow for applications. Because, go back up the bus, I just painted the picture that you're gonna cast a wide net and get a lot of people in. You're gonna do that either through word of mouth, ad spend, um, you know, it depends on, on where you're at. There's some cities where we actually still advertise in printed newspapers and go after baby boomers for equipment operators in some towns because they still read the local newspaper. Not, not everywhere, but in some, some cases, okay? But when they, when they call, we say, okay, go to this website, apply for the job. It still dumps them into the system, okay? Onboarding workflow. So let's say you hired somebody. Will Rogers, American actor, says, you never get a second chance to make a great first impression. You ever heard that quote? Well, that's the guy, it's not me. I put his name up there. Make sure you know it wasn't me, because I'm not taking credit. Somebody will call me out later. You never get a second chance to make a great first impression. Um, when you hire somebody, what happens next will have a tremendous impact on whether or not they stay in your company or are successful in your company. And I think that we do a poor job overall, and I know we did for sure ECF, uh, and, and certainly in my other company that preceded ECF, did a poor job of what do we do after we hire? What type of defined process is there after we hire somebody? Onboarding is extremely important because it's gonna set your, 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 your new team member up for success if you do it right. Uh, this is a crew leader in Broward in Florida. His name is Tyrone. He's a huge guy, man. He's like six foot four. He's an agronomic technician, tremendous team member. He worked at another company for, I think it was 15 years. One of the nationals, rotating management, meat grinder. Been with us for like six years now, no problems at all. Great guy, caught in a meat all this, All these acquisitions in the market, all this roll up, all this turmoil, there's all kinds of talent out there. You just gotta go get it, it's, it's all out there. Some, but the big companies, some branches are really well run, you're not getting the talent, but, but there's a lot that aren't. There's a lot of turmoil. So you should be able to get talent. We have a full employee orientation week when someone comes to work for ECF, a field position. The first day is all in the classroom. We have a complete library of orientation videos for them. After every video, it's why they're broken up. There's a test and they have to pass the test 100% or they go right back through that segment. So they cannot say they didn't know the policy or the expectation or the standard or anything. We do them in English, we do them in Spanish. Right now, Haitian Creole is being developed. After that, they spend the rest of the week with a field supervisor. And then in week two, they actually get assigned to a crew leader and a crew. Huge investment. It hurts when you need them operating in the field. But if you take it on the chin just one more week and do it like that and play the long game, you win. So that's just a shot of our employee orientation library. If you copy the URL, you'll find it and it'll ask for a password. So you can't, you can't watch the videos, okay? Unless you apply. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so that is, uh, that is, let me back up real quick. Uh, work with me. That is the recruiting game. Employee retention, reputation, margins and cash flow impact the environment and what we're able to do for our team members. Brand reach, what kind of brand do you have? What does it mean? Establishing an applicant workflow and then an onboarding workflow. So now I'm going to uh, do two things. I want to say thank you, and then um, 
Uh, well, let me start there. Let me start by saying thank you, because this is uh, for all of us, me included. And I'm not, even, I'm not from this state, but it's a weekday and it's nighttime and we're trying not to put you to sleep. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the privilege to be here with you um, and to the board for having me. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here. If I said something wrong or maybe I didn't use the best words, please forgive me. You know, it's, we're, we're in a hot seat up here, so I might not have said it quite right. Uh, forgive me. Um, if it was really offensive, I absolutely meant it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to close out with uh, I'm going to close out with one last video, and I'll be done once I once I step away. Um, I, I think as an industry, I'm going to give you just just my personal feelings on this. I, I'm from the East Coast, and so the the metros on the coasts for sure, and even a lot of the large urban markets inside of the middle of the country, but certainly along the coasts, it is predominantly immigrant workforce. Predominantly. Uh, you, you will not find domestic labor in, on the coast in the major markets. You will not find it in California either, in the major markets, in, on, on the west coast rather. A lot of the major cities, even in the Midwest, predominantly minority workforce. And the composite of our industry is predominantly domestic. And that, it's okay. Uh, I, I told you when I started, I'm a, pencil, I'm a country boy from Pennsylvania. I ac absolutely am. I grew up in dirt roads and horses. And I mean, so I think we've used this workforce or even uh, in middle America, we use the blue collar workforce in this non-union environment and we have not collectively done enough to protect them or to make sure that they are getting compensated the way they should or treated the way they should. Uh, sometimes we may yell or say something, uh, get charged up with a political issue and not realize what it means to the people who are working for us. Um, it can happen, we mean well, but we just don't realize the impact. Um, I want to see a lot more focus on frontline workers in a meaningful way from owners across the country. I want to see more compassion. Um, in this country, people always come together when there's a tragedy. People get more compassionate when bad things happen, they come together. Um, so it's there to tap into. I think we could be more compassionate for the workforce. Uh, I, my wife and I are so, we've built wealth in this industry and, and we're, we, I say I'm unapologetically wealthy because I worked my ass off, I did it the right way and I made money. That's, that's capitalism, that's the American dream, but I didn't shit on people the whole way. Or I tried not to, I'll say that. I tried hard. And, and I think we, we all, we, we, don't, we don't wanna do that to people. So think about your frontline workforce, think about the people that many who are living paycheck to paycheck, think about what they do every day. Um, give them a piece of your heart and you're gonna have a better business. You're gonna sip on life and you're gonna move the needle. So this video is for our people. And thank you. Run